what does it look like to build things? And how long does it take? And I was thinking of some great structures that we may see. And first, we start with this one. Ah, the St. Louis Arch. The, a perfect place to start in St. Louis. First place? That's a good... I don't know. But anyway, so we have... Oh, whatever, Steve. All right. Uh, but we have the arch here. And, uh, and the arch was uh, built in... Uh, I apologize. Here we go. The arch was built... Uh, and started in February 12, 1963, and uh, the last piece was placed in October 28, 1965. And so uh, that building structure, uh, it didn't, it wasn't something that was built overnight. It wasn't something that was just put together and uh, and this, uh, you know, in a couple months. It took time. It took almost three years to put the arch together. And then we see this. Um, that, of course, is the Eiffel Tower. And, uh, and these are structures that stand out to us. And the Eiffel Tower was built from 1887 to 1889. So it was a two-year process of putting this thing together. And it was being built, built up. And then uh, the last thing that we, we look at, which is appropriate, that's it in, it's in last place because uh, it's Chicago. But anyway, uh, uh, no, I don't know. Uh, the Sears Tower. But what's the new name for the Sears Tower? Willis Tower. So there you go. If, I guess if you have a lot of money, you can name towers after yourself. But anyway, but so let's just call it the Sears Tower. But anyway, but the Sears Tower, and here it was, and uh, and it was started in August 1970, and then it was uh, finished in 1973. But then people didn't come in too. Uh, it didn't start. It wasn't used until 1974, and so that was a four-year process from the moment it began to the moment it was finished. And so we see here that, that building things takes time. It's not always just a, a quick fix. It's not always just something that happens overnight. But it's something that takes time. It is something that needs to be invested in. It's something that needs to uh, have that sweat, that thing that works. And so, so this idea of building things up needs to be looked at as a, as a process. It needs to be looked at as uh, something that you can achieve, but don't expect it to happen overnight. All right, so we want to build things up. We want to make things right, okay? So how does that look when we talk about encouraging people? We need to build people up, not just one time, not just two times, but keep on building people up. How does it look in God's kingdom? We need to keep doing things. We need to keep building things. We need to make things better, not just once, not just twice, but keep on doing it. How does it look? How does it look when we are, are called to create? We need to keep creating. We need to keep making things. We need to keep doing things. And so that's really good. But the truth of the matter is, is that we talk about building and wanting these beautiful things and these big things coming from us, but often we're just stuck at the foundation. And we just look like we're at the foundation of it all. And the truth of the matter is that can be because of brokenness, the hardships that come along with life, the chaos that's around is, has consumed us so much that we're just stuck here at the foundation. We're stuck trying to put the first brick on to build up. And I think that something that we need to remember is that we as as followers of Christ need to help not just uh, not just ourselves but other people to begin creating strong foundations so that the bricks can be built up upon them. That when we build we need to have that good foundation so that so that the people who deal with brokenness and hardships are able to then not just stay in the foundation and stay there but begin to build up and do great things. And so that's something that I think we need to understand that we need to try to figure out in our lives in our relationship with Christ and in telling people about Christ is that we need to be actively involved in this. That we need to be so actively involved that we are helping laying those bricks in people's lives. Making strong foundations and help build them up. Help them to see the light at the end of the tunnel. That if they are wrapped up in the chaos of this world around us, that you are wrapped up in the chaos that's going on right now, and you think everything's just spinning out of control, you don't know how to make it to the end of the week, end of the month, or end of the year. Remember, it begins with that strong foundation, knowing that Christ is Lord. Remember that we as Christians are, able to, are supposed to extend our hand out to help those people, to help those individuals that need those bricks placed in their lives so they can start building up. I think we get to an idea here of how then, 
how, how, to, how to become a better builder. If we are called to be builders for, for Christ, if we are called to, to do things in a way that will uh, to build up God's kingdom, what does that look like? What does that look like and how is that going to, to be perceived by others? And I think the first thing is, is that how do we become a better builder? Is that remember it is not about you, it is about others. If you want to be a good builder, you don't think about yourself first. You think about how it's going to affect other people. How is it going to be used? If the Sears Tower was just built and from 1973 on, it never was used, then it was a selfish build. And we probably wouldn't be talking about it in a positive light. But in 74, people began to go in and use it. The building was built for other people to be used. In our lives, if we are dealing with our faith, if we are dealing with the chaos around us, if we just keep it to ourselves, then we're not going to be able to share and we're not going to be able to receive help. But remember, it's not just about you. It's about other people around you that you need to bring them in. To become a better builder, you need to have other people build with you. Just as Sue did in the thing, it was a whole lot better to work with a bunch of blocks than just two blocks. You want a bunch of people coming to the table. And so that's good. That's good. The second thing is, is that what do you pursue? And that's a question that you need to ask yourself. If you want to be a better builder, what do you pursue? What are you pursuing after? What are those things in your life that are your goals out there? Not the goals, but just what do you pursue? And I think the best way to ask yourself is, is an understanding, you know, am I pursuing the right thing? Is ask yourself, what are the things that get in, get in my way of, of the pursuit? What are the things that get in the way of my pursuit? Every Monday I start off by just writing everything that I have to get done by the end of the week. Make sure that I do all of these things. And what's funny is that by Wednesday, the list like triples. <laughs> and so all of a sudden I have these things that are getting in the way of the things that I really need to achieve by the end of the week. And so that's sometimes how it is just with our life. We have these things that you know we know, we desire to be uh, God... God's followers that are building His kingdom. We desire to be encouragers. We desire to be creators. But then all of a sudden, other things start to come in and take us different ways. And all of a sudden, what we want to pursue is not really what we want to pursue. And so we get all... Uh, we can get thrown off really quick. And so we see here, we see here with this in Romans fourteen nineteen it says this: Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to a mutual edification. Everything that we do is it leading to that peace that we are pursuing the right thing? Is everything we're doing trying to strive and make things better in that pursuit of God's kingdom in this world? Are we doing that? Are we achieving that? The third thing is, is becoming a better builder is this: uh, How much do you care? How much do you care about what's going on in this world? How much do you care about what's going on in, in people's life? Uh, the saying that, you know, uh, it's not about how much you know, it's about how much you care. There are a lot of people who know a lot of things. There are a lot of people who know a lot of things, but do they care? Do they generally care for individuals in this world? You know, and we can do that in the church as well. There's a lot of people that have been blessed that have been able to be raised by by their parents or their grandparents in church, and they can recite every Bible verse and maybe even recite it back, the Bible backwards. I don't know. They're just really gifted in knowing all that stuff. But if they don't apply it to anything, then it means nothing. If they don't understand that that knowledge doesn't translate into caring for individuals, then it, it, it's for naught. There's a song that says, uh, uh, "God," uh, or it says, "Break my heart for what breaks yours." You know, break my heart for what breaks God's heart. Do, do our hearts break for people? Do we care for people the way that God cares for people? 